calendar heads up for you. Um, this Thursday morning at 9.30, uh, the Secretary General and Dr. Tedros of the World Health Organization will hold a joint virtual press conference on WHO's global COVID-19 vaccination strategy. Uh, the event will be hosted by WHO out of Geneva, uh, held and held over Zoom. Uh, you will be sent the login uh, details. Uh, the Secretary General makes some remarks, so will the Director General of WHO, and then the Secretary General will take a few questions, and then the press conference will continue uh, with Dr. Tedros. We're also working on uh, creating another uh, separate moment for you to be able to speak to the Secretary General in person at some point, hopefully this week. Um, Turning to Afghanistan, at the end of a two-day visit to Herat, the heads of UNICEF and the World Food Program in Afghanistan, Hervé uh, Ludovic de Lis and Mary Ellen McGrorty, sounded the alarm on the dire state of malnutrition and food insecurity sweeping across Afghanistan. With the winter fast approaching, they say it is now a race against time to assist Afghan families who also lack access to safe water, health, and nutrition services. 14 million people in Afghanistan are facing acute food insecurity, and an estimated 3.2 million children under the age of five are expected to suffer malnutrition by the end of this year. The two UN agencies are adding 100 more mobile health and nutrition teams in the country. There are already about 168 mobile teams providing lifeline for children and mothers in hard-to-reach areas of Afghanistan. Since the beginning of 2021, WFP has provided food and nutrition assistance for 8.7 million people. Close to 4 million people were reached in September alone. Additionally, so far this year, UNICEF has provided treatment for severe malnutrition to more than 210,000 children. Our colleagues from WHO also said that after pause in activities, the WHO-supported polio program has resumed screening and vaccination of travelers moving between Afghanistan and Pakistan through the Torkham border crossing. WHO has also recently dispatched 64, mil excuse me, 64 medical kits to health facilities in the western region to cover the health needs of 64,000 people for the next three months. Since August, WHO has also airlifted 185 metric tons of essential medical supplies uh, through nine flights, including a shipment on Sunday. And as a reminder, the Afghanistan Flash Appeal, which requires $606 million to support about 11 million people with humanitarian aid through the end of 2021, has received $212 million. That's 35% funded, so those numbers are going up but we would appreciate some more cash. And you'll hear more about Afghanistan um, and food insecurity here tomorrow when uh, Mary Ellen McGorty, the WFP country director, uh, will join us live from Kabul uh, at the briefing. Turning to another humanitarian hotspot, Ethiopia, the World Food Program has completed its first round of food distribution to people impacted by the spread of conflict from Tigray into the Afar and Amhara regions. Since August, WFP has delivered food to nearly 300,000 people in two regions. However, WFP said that aid distributions in Tigray are lagging behind due to impediments to the movement of supplies. The second round of food distribution has been continuing in Tigray since late May, and more than 2.4 million people have been reached with food assistance in the northwest and parts of, the southern, of southern Tigray. WFP says anecdotal reports from the Tigray, Afar, and Amhara provinces suggest that food insecurity is rising as families flee from their homes and have their livelihoods destroyed. The Rome-based agency stressed it is absolutely vital that uh, he has full cooperation and support for all parties to the conflict so he can reach all affected population with urgently needed food assistance before we have a humanitarian catastrophe on our hands across all of northern Ethiopia. And turning to Syria, <clears throat> where we've received uh, reports that five million people are being affected by the ongoing water crisis in the north and northeast of the country. People across northern parts of Syria have been unable to reliably access sufficient and safe water due to low water levels, 
disruption of water systems and the already reduced operational capacity of water stations. Lack of safe drinking water is leading to an increased prevalence of waterborne diseases and is reducing a critical first line of defense to stem the COVID-19 pandemic. The lack of electricity also adds to the strain of public health education system and is disproportionately impacted the general and reproductive health of women and girls. We, along with our partners, have released a consolidated plan over the next six months, which will target 3.4 million of the most impacted people in uh, those areas of Syria as a result of the water crisis. The requirements identify the necessi necessity of a multi-sector response to $251 million. Only $51 million has been, $51 million have been received. Traveling south to Yemen, where Hans Grunberg, our envoy for Yemen, concluded a three-day visit to Riyadh. Uh, Mr. Grunberg met with the Saudi foreign uh, minister, Faisal bin Farhan, Saudi ambassador to Yemen, Mohammed al-Jaber, and other senior Saudi officials. He also met with Yemeni Vice President Ali Mohsan and other Syrian Yemeni, Syria senior Yemeni officials. He said that ending the conflict and reaching a comprehensive and inclusive political solution that meets the aspirations of Yemenis should be the primary urgent objective of all relevant actors. While in Riyadh, he also met with the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Policy, uh, Josep Borrell, the State Secretary of the German Federal Foreign Ministry, uh, Miguel Berger, and diplomats from the permanent members of the Security Council uh, based there. And he will travel today, he is traveling today from Riyadh to Aden in Yemen for more consultations. And at the Security Council this morning, Bintu Keita, the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC, called on the council members to continue supporting the UN's work. Um, she said that security and the protection of civilians remain the greatest challenges in the country's east. Cooperation between Congolese armed forces and the UN peacekeepers have been strengthened, and there is progress in operational planning and execution. However, she added, much remains to be done, including to ensure that human rights are systematically respected in the fights against armed groups in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On the humanitarian situation, Ms. Keita reminded council members that over 5 million people are displaced within the country. She called on the international community to provide funding for the humanitarian appeal. And in Pakistan, uh, our UN team there, led by resident coordinator Julian Harnais, continues to work with authorities to address the health, humanitarian, and socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. As of the 2nd of October, more than 82 million, do uh, 82 million doses of vaccines have been administered. Nearly 30 million people have been fully vaccinated, with twice as many being partially vaccinated. On the health front, UNICEF is helping to ensure that essential primary care services continue in nearly 140 health facilities, for more than 3.6 million men, women, and children. More than 110,000 children have been immunized against measles. UNICEF also helped to train thousands of frontline workers and community volunteers trained in identifying COVID-19 cases. The UN team has delivered 1,000 oxygen concentrators, millions of personal protective items to frontline health workers across the country. And a um, COVAX update from this hemisphere, Honduras, Ecuador, and Peru, have all received additional shipments of vaccines from COVAX. Across uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, nearly 53 million doses have been distributed through COVAX in 33 countries with logistical support from the Pan-American Health Organization. And a report released today by the WMO in Geneva says water-related hazards like floods and droughts are increasing because of climate change. According to the report, 3.6 billion people have had inadequate access to water at least one month per year in 2018. By 2050, this is expected to rise to more than 5 billion. More information online. And a new report by the UN Environment Program says that rising sea surface temperatures have driven the loss of 14% of coral since 2009. The report warns of an irrevocable loss of coral reefs would be catastrophic as they are home to at least a quarter of all marine species providing critical habitat and a fundamental source of protein as well as life-saving medicines. It is estimated that hundreds of millions of people around the world depend on them for food, jobs, and protection from storms and erosion. Full report is online, and today is World Teachers' Day. 
Take a moment to think about those teachers that have impacted your life. This year's theme is Teachers at the Heart of Education Recovery. The day focuses on the support um, that teachers need to fully contribute to the pandemic recovery process. In a joint statement, UNESCO, the ILO, UNICEF, and Education International called on countries to invest in teachers and prioritize them in global education recovery efforts so that every learner has access to a qualified and supported teacher. Celia. <coughs> Stephanie, it's about the DRC. The mission has been in DRC for more than 20 years. Why are we, are, is the UN still there? Uh, is the country a lost cause? Uh, we did not make any progress. What is going on there? Well, I, I don't believe, uh, I don't believe any country is a lost cause. Uh, I think there has been uh, progress in the DRC over the years, in, in state institutions, uh, in humanitarian aid that we're able to deliver. Um, but there has been constant setbacks, especially in the East, uh, from non-state uh, actors, from terrorist groups that have been infl inflicting unspeakable violence on civilian population. And one of our main roles of the peacekeeping mission is there to protect uh, civilians. Philippe, and then we'll come back to the front. Thank you, Stefan. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, can you confirm that the, the SG would be part of the meeting of a meeting of the Security Council tomorrow afternoon on Ethiopia? And uh, can you tell us if Ethiopia give, uh, gave you more info about the why they expelled uh, seven people from? On, on your last part, no. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're, we're continuing to have contact with Ethiopian authorities at, at different um, levels, but I think the situation from our end is pretty uh, is pretty clear. As you can see, our, our humanitarian operations are continuing. I would say we're kind of struggling to continue, uh, given uh, the impediments uh, that we face, but we're continuing to do our work to the best of our ability with the resources that we have. Uh, I hope to be able to confirm um, the Secretariat's participation uh, a bit later on uh, today. James. Record number of military flights by the Chinese Air Force over the defensive area of Taiwan. What is the Secretary General's reaction to this, and does he see it as provocation? Um, I don't have any language on that for you at this very moment. Is it an issue uh, that the Secretary General is concerned about? I, I mean, I, I think the... Secretary General is following uh, many issues uh, closely, uh, but at this point, I don't have anything more to add. Can you get back to us yeah, with some yeah, language? Because yeah, yeah, it yeah. seems to be quite no, a no, big I, issue. I, yeah. Okay, uh, see if there's anything in the chat. Uh, Mikhail Ignatiu, you have a question. I think I know the question, and fortunately, I think I know the answer, but go ahead. Stefan, uh, good afternoon. If I may, I, I wanted to read you a statement by the president of the of Cyprus, and I wanted your comment, please. He says that the non-issuance of a statement by the United Nations after the formal meeting in New York, as a result of the withdrawal of the Turkish Cypriot leader, is disturbing. Mr. Anastasiadis emphasized that the decision was not a compromise but rather an obligation of Antonio Guterres to act within the terms of his mandate. Do you have uh, an answer to this, uh, Mr. Stefan? Continue uh, to work with the leaders of the two communities in Cyprus uh, to move the Cyprus issue forward in a positive uh, direction. It has been a long-standing uh, issue that the United Nations has been involved in, and he will continue to work in that direction in very good faith, I will and add. Why he if I may, why he changed his, his uh, decision for the um, uh, special, uh, uh, how you call it, envoy to Cyprus? He said to the two leaders that he's going to send one. Why he changed his, his decision? Well, 
I, I'm not aware of a change in decision since uh, we, we never announced a decision uh, in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you for that short briefing. Monica, all yours.